Good evening, everyone. My name is Susan Hodgen. I'm Moscow's second Poet Laureate, and this is the second session in the seminar of the things that we collect and why. The poem that I have um, written is called Before Fiberglass. Tools were never left outside, never left against an exterior wall, propped up along a fence or tree. We heard our father's voice long before we saw his swift stride coming. When he found one tool left outside, drowning in cloudburst, or stuck in scorching midday sun, or on the ground, fallen, a born casualty. We learn tools, treasures held in our good hands. No wonder our father ragged our hands in linseed oil, that golden miracle that breathed the gray wood of livestock and garden tools alive, like longer days, warmer temperatures that bring the bud from bark. I never knew until my own hands showed me the vertical ridges running amber, the pole length of wood, the hickory handle, the shovel, the post hole digger, the hoe, the pick, the pitchfork, the rake, the scythe, the sledge, the axe, a thing of beauty. Thank you. Good evening and welcome. I'm BJ. I'm the arts assistant for the city of Moscow. Thank you for being here tonight. I have the pleasure of introducing Beth and Christine from the Nez Perce National Historical Society. Um, if you haven't seen this little postcard outside, they're on a the table outside and you can grab one if you want a keepsake or something to take with you for the evening to remind you a little bit about what was spoken. But Beth and Christine are going to introduce themselves and I just wanted to let you know we are recording this evening. So have a great time. Thank you for coming. Okay, we got a small crew tonight. <laughs> oh, all right. Mm -hmm. So my name is Beth Erty. I am the Archivist and Cultural Resources Program Manager at Nez Perce National Historical Park. I've been with the Park Service now for almost 10 years, um, uh, five years full time as the park's archivist. Um, so tonight we're going to be, uh, I'll be talking about photographs primarily. So Christine. And I'm Christine Lear. I'm the museum curator at the Nez Perce National Historical Park. And I am a Nez Perce kind of uh, newbie, I guess you could say. Uh, I started about a year ago. I was previously a seasonal ranger though at Whitman Mission National Historic Site. So I will be talking about objects and um, there's a lot to cover, a lot of material types. So I'm gonna try to do my best, but understand that we might be limited on time to really get into some of the um, deeper conservation issues and preservation issues regarding some of the items. So um, I'm gonna be starting off first and then Beth will be talking next. So objects well we have a lot here as you can see we've got leather we've got ceramics glass plastic wood so there's a lot of things um, in the museum collections and stuff that you might have in your own homes and things to maybe consider that you can implement in your uh, homes so with that let's see if this works cool all right so kind of ideally we don't want to have storage environment spaces that look like the ones on the left um, you want maybe something a little bit more organized, some stuff that you see on the right, maybe place into boxes or a little bit more organized. Having that clutter is n not ideal in a museum environment setting. So with museum environments, three things are very key. That's temperature, the humidity, and the lighting level. So those things might seem kind of obvious, but they can actually make a huge difference in your collection space. Uh, and I know that's something that I take for granted just because um, at our park, we already have, uh, we have a system that kind of does the relative humidity and the temperature and that maintains it for us. But obviously with the seasons changing, um, the temperature may change in your own homes and the humidity levels. Also, maybe you have objects that are in direct 
direct sunlight from windows and that can make a huge difference as well. So keeping your objects in a central location away from outside walls, away from potential hazards and those hazards could be water pumps or heating vents. I think those are things maybe we don't really think about but they can cause long-term damage uh, as well as daylight. Ideally, you don't want to store items in attics or basements. You want to place um, objects in boxes like you see here or maybe even in bins. Closed cabinets are preferable because that will help with agents of deterioration. And um, you also do want to avoid open storage spaces. Obviously, you do see open storage here in one of these pictures, the top one on the right. Um, I guess you kind of have to vary on like what items you would want to keep on open storage. And I think Beth will talk a little bit more about this, but also you do want to be considerate and keep your objects about four to six inches off the ground. So you'll kind of see that being displayed in these uh, pictures here, unlike what you see off to the left. So again, um, something to keep in mind though, sometimes you just have to work with what you got, understand that these aren't necessarily things that you can make immediate changes to, but things to maybe consider um, in the long term as well. So talking about ideal temperature for a museum collection space, we're thinking about 64 to 68 uh, degrees. Uh, at our collection storage space in Spalding, we keep it at 60. I think it's a little extreme. It gets pretty cold in there, um, but you definitely don't want to go over 70. So somewhere in between would be ideal. As for ideal humidity, you want 45 to 55 degrees. And again, that can fluctuate. It depends on the season, but ideally that would be the nice range that you should keep it in. And then, um, for the lighting, lighting is huge. Um, you definitely want to avoid objects coming in direct contact with windows um, or even just the lights because really in the long term, it might not be so obvious, but it can cause severe damage. So an example is, I wish I had a picture to show you guys, but there might be one in a later slide. At Whitman Mission National Historic Site, um, when I was a seasonal ranger, I ended up changing out some objects that had been on display for about 20 to 30 years not ideal in the museum world, right? We want to rotate those out on a regular basis. So um, there was this beautiful beaded vest. I think it was Nez Perce. And it, every time a visitor would walk into the museum space, the lights would come on and it would shine directly onto this vest. So when I took it off display, it, I mean, it's probably one of the worst cases I've seen of light damage, but the, the backing fabric on the vest and the inside had completely faded. I mean, the, when you lo opened up the inside, it was like this dark blue color and had completely faded to like this almost white light blue. So it's just, you don't want to, that at all for any of your items, um, but that's just something to be aware of because it's, you know, you don't think 20 years, but in the long term, it actually does cause a lot of damage. Um, and kind of going a lot with a good environment, we're talking about agents of deterioration. Oh, that's the picture I was telling you about with um, light damage and fading. This is what can happen, right? So you have, uh, you have pictures of mold. It's maybe hard to see from far away. Pest damage right here. So these are just some of the main agents of deterioration that you might come across or you might see in your own homes and just things to be aware of. We already talked about temperature, humidity, and light. Um, and I'll be talking a little bit more about the mold and pests, briefly cover water and fire, and then also pollutants, negligence, and physical force are other things to be aware of. Um, so <laughs> uh, we have agents of deterioration. I'm not sure if you've ever heard that term or uh, come across it, but they're used to identify agents that threaten museum collections or objects that you may have. So uh, direct physical force, it's kind of obvious, but um, it can be any sudden or catastrophic or gradual damage over time. So things like improper handling or support or earthquakes, things like that. Um, even just items, so like a good example is I had this plate that I made in my pottery class back in high school and I moved recently and I thought I had it packed properly but just the um, box dropped, it cracked in half. So just things like that happen. So just to be aware of and things that, um, unfortunately things like that do happen. So trying to mitigate those uh, issues if possible. Covering, um, going a little bit more specifically though into mold, this is a huge problem that you might see or come across in any of your objects in your own homes. It's, um, it can be a big problem. So you'll find it in places of higher temperature, poor air circulation, dim light, or accumulated dirt. Um, and it will also, for dangers, it can cause severe respiratory problems, allergies, dizziness, headaches. Susceptible objects include organic material, specifically cotton, linen, paper, wood, leather, 
And on those items, it can cause severe staining and decrease the strength of their structure. So please be aware if you do see any mold. Um, and if you do see it, what you want to do immediately is isolate it. So you can isolate it in um, polyethylene bags or any plastic bags that you have in your own homes. And then you want to put the item in a freezer for at least 24 hours, if not longer. And that will uh, help, I guess, reduce the situation. And you can also expose them to sunlight as well. That's another option. But you don't want to touch the mold as it will help spread the spores. So. Um, if you do see mold in an area in your own homes, again, isolate the object, and then if the mold is dry, be sure to vacuum it up afterwards. In terms of pests, that is another big problem and something that I've actually come across in uh, the museum collection space. Maybe you guys have encountered that yourself in your own homes. Uh, things like pests, or sorry, uh, mice, rats, beetles, and moths are all very common, maybe even spiders cobwebs, those kind of things, they can severely weaken, disfigure, and do irreparable long-term damage to your object. So do please be aware of pests. That, that's a very big one. Um, <clears throat> one thing that we talk about sometimes, and maybe you're aware of this, but hantavirus, coming across that from mice or rat droppings. If you see any evidence of that in your own homes, please be aware. Uh, we do have some handouts on hantavirus if you are interested in reading more about it. I know I had worked with some collections at WSU in their uh, repository and we would go through some of these boxes and there'd be like mouse droppings and we, it was something that wasn't brought to my attention so I kind of wish I had been a little bit more aware just to make sure that we were wearing, you know, gloves or wearing masks just for our own health and safety. So that is a big problem that um, you might encounter. But um, in terms of pests, if you do come across an item, specifically, let's say like a textile, for instance, that has been eaten away by moss, what you want to do is isolate that into a freezer, uh, kind of like what you would do with mold. And um, the freezing method should only be used on certain objects. It's kind of up to your judgment. There's definitely some that I wouldn't recommend that you put in a freezer. Um, and then not an option, or, and then you can also use toxic fumigants if you want. I wouldn't recommend that just for your own health and safety, but also be aware of the objects in your surrounding areas. Um, and then we also, we already touched on the, the light issue as well. But uh, in terms of agents of deterioration, just having good housekeeping and maintenance, uh, making sure you're placing objects where there's no food, drink, or plant materials, again, that will attract pests. and. Another thing to consider is sticky traps or bug traps. So we have these uh, in our museum collection space um, and they're great. So again, if you think you have a pest problem, maybe put out some traps and if you, you know, they come in here and you can identify them and maybe mitigate the problem that way. All right, so moving on to item, oh, sorry. Then we have fire and flood. I forgot about this. They are in our packets right here. Well, we have a sheet of, dedicated to each one. So this is what the f uh, federal, shoot, forgot the acronym, Federal Emergency Management Agency. Um, they came up with a sheet for what to do after a fire, after a flood. It's a great resource. So in case you ever do have a fire in your homes or if you ever do have a flooding issue, things to be aware of, um, you will have you know ash or shit on your objects or maybe they come in contact with um, sewer or chemicals in the water. So things to be aware of, the sheet will have a lot of information. I won't go over it, but um, that's in the packet right there. So p uh, please look through that. So moving on to textiles, that's, there's, there's a lot of information. So I'm kind of gonna go over it kind of quickly. But things that you might have in your own homes are like wedding dresses, military uniforms, quilts, blankets, flags. Those are all things that you might want to consider storing in these methods that I'll be talking about. Um, before you go and store the items, the best way to preserve them would just to vacuum them off, get the dust and any pollutants or other particulates off of them. Um, you also want to be on the lookout for musty odor, brittleness, tarnish of threads, mold growth, and evidence of bugs. These are all other major issues that you want to try to avoid. And so when we're talking about textiles, ideally they should be displayed horizontally in fat. That will uh, help release the stress of the weight and minimize damage to fibers. It'll also provide support and protection. And you want to avoid them being folded and scrunched up in tight spaces. So pretend this, so I'll, talking about flat storage, this is the preferred method. Ideally, 
if you can do it, I understand though that sometimes in your own homes there's a lack of space. So uh, pretend this is like a really important piece of textile. Uh, what you can just do for at least a small one, you can place it inside like a box for instance or a plastic bag or a plastic box. And you can have like a layer of tissue paper at the bottom and you just place it inside and then you want to put another layer of tissue paper on top of that and cover it up. That's the most important thing with textiles, making sure that they're covered so that any agents of deterioration won't contaminate the uh, object further. Um, the other preferred method, let's say you have a flag or a quilt or a blanket that's just too large, you're not going to be able to store it flat. What you can do is do a rolled storage that like you see in the picture. It's actually a project I'm currently working on because a lot of our quilts and blankets are actually folded. So uh, what you can do is get some type of tubing like you see here. Ideally, you would like to put some type of barrier between this and the object. So like acid-free tissue will work. And you just roll up your um, textile. Ideally, you should have another barrier of tissue paper on the outside and you just roll it up and um, then you can cover it with uh, things like mylar would work or even um, Tyvek here. Tyvek's a great resource. It's very flexible. It's very durable. It's, uh, I mean, you don't have to, you can crinkle it all you want. It's not going to tear or rip. It also, you can dust it quite easily. So that's another method that you can do as well. It's a great resource to do if you can, um, use rolled storage, especially since it does alleviate a lot of space issues if you do have larger items and textiles. So another method is hanging. So again, sometimes things like wedding dresses or like military uniforms, you might not be able to lay flats. You will probably place them in a hanger and that's probably where they're at their moment. So I have my uniform here, but let's say I wanted to um, have it for long-term preservation. Ideally, you would like to put some type of padding right here in the shoulder space to alleviate the stress on that area and the weight. Padding can be anything from ethafoam that you place and kind of, you kind of have to work with it, but um, you could do some type of structure like that and tie it around. Also, uh, you have this little stocking net that you can fill with padding. This is a great resource as well that you can put on your hanging. Um, on your hanger as well. And then like you see in the picture, if you can, placing some type of muslin covering or even some type of cloth material again to uh, with the agents of deterioration. And um, folded is not ideal, but if it's the last resort option and something that you just, you don't have enough space or just things to consider, um, this is actually how some of our textiles are currently stored in the collection space at the museum but we're working on getting that fixed. But what you can do is just um, put some type of padding in between the creases as to alleviate that stress and of the weight on the fibers. So those are just some things to be aware of. Um, I have included some instructions on how to like dust covers or rolling a textile. They're also included in this packet. So if you do have questions or you want to know more information about that, they are included as well. So moving on to wood, um, the key to caring for wooden objects is a good environment. Uh, it's kind of a standard for all the objects, but particularly for wood, you know, you have things like furniture, farming tools, figurines, and um, also composite objects. So items, more than one item, uh, like wood, um, metal. So a uh, good environment for storage, you want to dust with a vacuum or a cotton cloth. You don't want to use it as feather dusters that could um, get stuck on your wooden objects. And um, no water or solvents as well. That's a no-no. And organic materials are especially susceptible to pests and mold damage, shrinking and swelling, erosion, splitting, and human damage. I don't have too much more to offer about wood. It's not an object I work with too much, but those are just some things to be aware of as well. Metals, uh, this, is, this is a tricky one. Uh, we, metals, you know, you might have things in your collection like coins and jewelry or military metals and silverware and brass. 
The great thing about them is there's no sensitivity to lights or pests, but unfortunately, uh, your primary concerns can be tarnish and corrosion, and that's really, really hard to come back from after it already starts. So um, you see the corrosion on the far right picture, tarnish on the silverware in the middle, and you have some corroding happening on this object as well. So corrosion is, a, is caused from moisture and oxi oxidation, environmental pollutants, and salt. And the reactions can look different on various surfaces, so that's something to be aware of. It can look red, as you see in that picture, or orange, or purple, or brown. Um, also on silverware, or, or I guess I should say silver or copper alloy items, you will see tarnish, like you see in the middle. Um, but uh, if there is a patina on the outside, you can degrease the metal with uh, some type of degreasing product or put a protective wax finish on it. However, if your metal items are severely corroded, I would consider contacting a conservator, especially and consider all options before removing some layers because sometimes it's just too far gone to really do much about it. Um, for items that you see here on the far left picture, you can actually take a bamboo, ske bamboo skewer or a toothpick and just actually, um, it's actually quite easy to remove that uh, corroding that's happening. So if you do see that on some of your metal items, that's actually an easy fix. And the one thing with metals I will mention as well is um, it's really preferable to have the humidity at less than 35% percent. Unfortunately, a lot of our objects, you know, we have multiple material types in one room, so that's not ideal, but it is something just to be aware of. So talking about stone, ceramic, glass, and plastic, um, for ceramic and glass, the most profound effects are just your physical forces, like I was talking about, you know, things with dropping them. Um, unfortunately, that happens. And um, the only other thing to really be aware about is dust that you'll get on the surface, but those are easy fixes, right? You can just vacuum or use a con uh, rag to clean that up. Handle as little as possible. Use both hands when handling, and you don't want to stack ceramic or glass or um, those objects together, as that can also cause breakage and um, objects being chipped. And you also want to avoid using tape or sticky labels on the surface as the residues can cause irre irreversible damage. Um, I was going to mention something else, but I can't. Oh, yeah. So um, if you have like pots or vases that you definitely would like to see a little bit more protection, one thing that you can do for something like this is we have a little ethafoam tubing right here. Um, or you can even do something like a stocking net, and you just um, you would glue it together and then you just kind of place it inside like that and that creates a little bit more of a stable support structure for your object. And especially if they're on open storage shelving, that is something you might want to consider. <coughs> As for stones, um, the one thing to be aware of is dirt, dust, oils, water, atmospheric pollutants, and biological agents. These will all affect some of your stone objects. Um, you also do want to be aware if you have really large stone items, placing them maybe on lower shelving units um, rather than having them high up just for your own safety concerns. And that goes for any other object as well, but particularly stone objects. Um, you can also keep small stones or even other some of your other smaller objects in baggies. That's um, another option as well. If you're afraid they might get lost or something, that's another good thing to consider. I don't have too much to say on plastics, uh, what you see on the far right. Just some things to be aware of or signs of deterioration are stickiness, crumbling, discoloration, warping, crazing, and or embrittlement. You also never want to put adhesives to the surface. Um, there's really not too much to mitigate once plastic starts deteriorating. Uh, the best method is just long-term preservation, periodic inspection, making sure that you vacuum and brush off dust, things like that. And then the last one we'll get to are leather and skin products. So you have things like leather belts or rawhide, um, maybe even saddles or footballs, things like that. So biological organisms are attracted to skin and hide products, making these materials subject to quick and irreversible damage. So um, they're also really susceptible to mold growth. 
You definitely want to avoid storing them near water and avoid storing near heat. They can cause drying and or shrinkage. So that's kind of what you see here in this picture. Um, you have a buckskin moccasin on the left um, and then actually this is kind of the bottom of one of the moccasins in our collection just due to long-term damage. Also probably came in contact with water which is why it kind of hardened up so you do want to be aware of that. Um, and like I said, it leads to warping or cracking tears in the skin like you see in the upper right hand picture. And for leather, spewing is a big problem that you might see as well. So the bottom right picture, it's maybe hard for you guys to see, but the little white dots are what spew looks like on leather items. Nothing to be concerned about, it'll happen. It's just something, um, it's a migration of fats and oils from within the leather that crystallize on the surface. Um, it can also be caused by additional flats, uh, a vast difference in the temperature and or humidity. So just by wiping them away, you can get rid of it. But there is, uh, I guess, spewing stuff that you or spewing, um, I guess, cream that you can put on the surface of materials, uh, leather materials, if you so do want to. But um, when you are handling leather and same with any other objects, but specifically leather, Wearing gloves is probably the best just because the oils on your skin might come in contact with the leather. So you do want to be aware of that because that can also cause damage in the long term as well. Um, and then for resources, we have uh, provided links that are in your packets and handouts. Uh, the NPS Museum Handbooks has a lot of great resources if you have further questions about some of the stuff we covered as well as conservagrams. This is where I get actually a lot of my information about conservation and museum material objects. Um, some books, if you're interested in um, wanting to uh, purchase any, we have conservation. This is a great resource. I also frequently refer to the American Indian, a practical and cultural guide. Um, this isn't only just good for ethnographic material, but any other object types. They go into great detail in here as well. And um, American Alliance of Museums, Smithsonian Museum Conservation, Federal Emergency Magi Management Agency, Museum Pest, Gaylord Archival, and University Projects are all great websites. And I think Beth will be going over that more in detail, at least with Gaylord and University, about where you can purchase some materials if you so desire to um, have in your own homes. And I think with that, I will pass it off to Beth to cover archival. All right, good evening, everyone. My name is Beth Erty. I am the Archivist and Cultural Resources Program Manager at Nez Perce National Historical Park. So I've done this workshop a few times around the area. I can make it take three hours. I can make it take 25 minutes like I'm about to do right now. <laughs> so um, again, Please refer to the, the packets that, um, that we've given out. There's a lot of really great and valuable information in there. What I'll be doing tonight, I'll do a quick rundown of a history of photographic processes and then sort of a best practices for taking care of your stuff too. Um, and once I'm through, then we'll sh certainly have time for questions as well. And if there's something that you think of later um, after you leave here tonight, please don't hesitate to contact Christine or I. Um, we are your faithful public servants. So, all right. <clears throat> I like using really wacky photos in, um, in my examples of uh, photographic processes. So um, you'll see some doozies tonight. So here's an example of the very first uh, photograph ever captured, 1826. 27 somewhere in there in France, uh, the title, The View from the Window at Le Graal. Um, <clears throat> so this is it. All right, so early 1800s, first photograph. 1839, daguerreotypes come along. Um, so daguerreotypes are really your first example of popular photography. Um, it was invented by uh, Louis Jacques Monde Daguerre. It's a copper plate coated with silver and a mixture of chemicals adhering to the silver. It's inserted into a box with a lens. Then a plate is exposed for one minute in a well-lit studio. Um, the plate is then removed, um, exposed to other chemicals, magnesium, bromide, iodine, awesome mixture of chemicals, um, and it made a one-of-a-kind positive images. It's a pretty expensive process as well. 
Um, Samuel Morris picked up on this process and brought it to the United States um, somewhere in the 1840s. Um, these little cases that they're kept in, they're about like that big. Um, they're made of generally made of leather or thermoplastic. Um, they kind of have a, this creepy mirror-like surface that will look back at you um, just because of the, um, the chemical processes for the developing of a daguerreotype. Um, maybe um, hand tinted as well. Um, and they're possible uh, that it'll tarnish if the seal on that case is not tight. If you have any daguerreotypes, awesome. If you do, do not take them out of the case. Um, you, you will do some irreparable damage. So leave it in the case, um, kind of leave it as an artifact of its time. So after daguerreotypes, ambrotypes come along. Same deal generally. Um, the way that, uh, Ambrotypes work. Um, it's a wet collodion process, so cellulose nitrate, which is kind of a precursor to the film that we know today, and ether alcohol spread on a glass surface um, makes a one of a kind positive on glass with covering on the back of um, paper, velvet, or lacquer. So if you flip that guy over, um, you'd, the photograph backing would be paper or leather um, or some sort of weird lacquer from the 19th century. There are all kinds of them. Again, kept in a leather or thermoplastic case uh, to protect damage. Um, and the easiest way to identify these is with a magnifying glass. Um, and it looks, the, the surface of these will look pretty smooth. The next photographic process that I'm gonna talk about called tin types. Um, tin types are generally a little bit rougher, but ambrotypes are pretty smooth. Again, leave it in its case, don't take it out. Uh -huh. On to the tin type. This is where we start getting into those nutty pictures. Um, so the tin type, same process generally as the ambrotype, but um, uh, the positive is created onto uh, enameled iron, um, also known as a ferrotype. Um, and it looks like the surface of an egg. It'll have little pox in it. Um, it's a good way to tell. These were really around from like pretty short period of time, mid 1850s up to about 1880. Um, and these are not always found inside of a case. There's no real reason to encase them because um, the ferrotype or the tintype, they're pretty stable. Um, the surface is not usually um, affected by air or oils. Um, and what will affect these though is light. Um, tintypes are particularly susceptible to light. All right. Next process, the collodion wet plate negative process. Um, there's some real um, artsy photographers that are still into collodion wet plate. They're doing beautiful, beautiful work. Um, so collodion wet plates developed um, also in the mid 1800s in England. Um, uh, this guy named William Harry Fox Talbot developed a paper process for the collodion wet plate negative where the chemical compound is spread on wax paper to produce a negative um, called a Talbot type or a calotype. Um, and Talbot ended up uh, patenting this process and then um, getting it over to the United States eventually as well. <sighs> this picture is just nuts. Um, <laughs> all these women with really long hair and the guy sitting in the middle. I don't know. So albumin prints, um, they're named for their binding agent. What's, ho what's holding those layers of the photograph together? It's egg white. Um, invented by Louis Desire Blancard Evrard. Um, it's about a 30 second exposure process. So this is when photographs uh, and the creation of photographs start getting real quick. Um, so this uh, used silver nitrate as a fixative in the process, um, and it's able to be mass produced. These were really big from the mid 1800s up until about 1900. Produces um, a glossy, warm tone, thin paper, and often mounted on a board like um, a carte de visite or a cabinet card. So I have an example of a um, carte de visite from my family here. This is a uh, the Johannings in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. Um, carte de visites were really popular just as something that you would give out to your friends. Um, they're, they're portable, they're easily produced, um, quick. Um, you will note that on the back of that photograph, my Aunt Judy took a pen and wrote family names on the photograph. I don't recommend doing that at all. Kudos, Judy, for identifying everybody in that picture, but if you can at all uh, avoid writing directly on a photograph, 
please avoid doing that if you really need to use a pencil. The best way to go about it is to uh, encase that photograph in a paper sleeve like one of these guys and record your information on the outside of the sleeve. So we covered the carte de visite, um, really popular in the mid to late uh, 1800s. Um, these were generally sold by the dozen as well. Um, <laughs> both Fuller Bill and then this fabulous contortionist here. Um, yeah, produced by the dozen, super cheap so people could give them out. Uh, these are pretty popular. I, I imagine that um, even in the West here where photography equipment was kind of rare, not, not around all that much, even in the West here, people were trading up carte de visite. We have plenty of them in the Park Museum collections as well. I'm sure Latah County Historical Society has a bunch of them as well. So this is when you really start to see mass production of photography and um, just kind of your average Joe being able to give pictures to people. Along the same lines of carte de visite, cabinet cards. Also very popular to be um, given away to people. Um, they're, a, uh, they're just a little bit larger than carte de visite. So your typical carte de visite is about that size. Um, cabinet cards are just a smidge bigger. <clears throat> Gelatin silver prints. Um, next process, uh, produce your black and white prints. Uh, light sensitive silver compounds are um, suspended in gelatin instead of egg whites. Um, essentially the same darkroom paper that we could buy today. That's what those processes are going on to. So I have an example, another family pick here of um, what I'm pretty sure is a gelatin silver print. Um, and you can kind of see the silver sheen to it. So there's that one. And these are my mom's hardy German immigrant family. Name yep, go Judy. Yep. <laughs> but at least she didn't write on the picture, right? So, yeah. What's the date of the picture? This one is uh, approximately, I think, like 1890. Yeah, so you can kind of see that silver sheen going on there. So it was okay to write on the side? Yeah, as long as you're not directly writing directly on the back. The back. Yeah. But the when you fold this over, there you go. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yes. <laughs> I'm very fortunate that both sides of my family were really great about saving photographs, so I have good examples to share with you guys here. <laughs> All right. Then we get into stereographs. I don't have any examples of stereographs here today, but they are super cool. Um, so it's like kind of your your precursor to the the little kiddos view view master. Yes. Who's it? Yep. So take your um, your stereograph image, um, which there there's two identical images there. They've got a little bit of a curve to them. Stick them in that cool viewer, um, and then the the, the image just kind of comes together and you've kind of got a 3D image of stuff. The New York Public Library has all of their stereographs digitized online and they have, um, they've got some sort of funky software that will do the 3D effect for you mm. on your computer. So that's super cool. There's, um, there's a few uh, stereographs from when the Nez Perces were exiled to Oklahoma. There's a few stereographs that are available online through New York Public Library that you can get that 3D effect. It's, it's very eerie. Um, all right, cellulose nitrate. So now we're moving into the 20th century and uh, 20th century uh, photographic processes. Really, um, 1889 is when those first kind of uses of film show up, um, but, but really this is the kind of standard of film through about 1950. Um, notches on the film, um, so in, your, um, in the edges of the film, a lot of times if there is, is there a laser pointer on here? Oh, nope, not that one. That one. So um, this this particular example is labeled clearly nitrate film. Other times, though, there'll be little notches in the edge of the film that will tell you if it's nitrate film. Um, the thing with nitrate film, it deteriorates quickly. Um, it turns an amber color, starts breaking down, like that example there, um, becomes really uh, tacky and emits nitric acid. Um, 
uh, it kind of looks frothy too and will disintegrate into a brown powder and is extremely flammable. Um, so most museums and archival institutions, if they have discovered that they have um, nitrate film in their collection, those images will be scanned and the nitrate film will often be um, discarded at that point and they'll just hang on to the scans or the reproduction prints of, of cellulose nitrate. Um, a number of movie houses in Hollywood lost their film collections because of um, fires started by deterioration of cellulose nitrate. So something to be really careful about and aware of. <sighs> All right. So uh, getting into the next type of uh, most popular film, cellulose acetate. Um, something that we deal with with cellulose acetate is vinegar syndrome. Um, it's it's what it sounds like. Your film, once it starts deteriorating, it uh, starts smelling like vinegar. Uh, at Washington State University, where I kind of did most of my archival training, there was a large collection of photographs from the Hutchinson Photography Studio, um, what's now Porchlight Pizza in downtown. But those, was, uh, those photographs were all cellulose acetate, and you'd walk down into the archival um, storage spaces at WSU, and you would just be hit with that vinegar smell. So um, they're, doing, they're doing everything right. Um, they've, got, they've, got secure, um, they've got secure, I guess, access to all of those images. They're not losing them. But that, that vinegar syndrome is progressing and happening. Um, cellulose acetate, though, is not flammable like cellulose nitrate. So um, there's, there's no worries or concerns there. Um, as an example of what cellulose acetate will do, I'm sure you guys have all seen this, it just curls. Yep, uh, becomes brittle. Um, and it'll, it'll warp and uh, it'll kind of film or form funky crystals too. So I don't even know what these are of. Oh, it's my nephews, okay. So, <laughs> yep, so an example of what not to do with your film. All right. So, um, and then t today, if you're still shooting with film, you're generally shooting with a polyester film that's pretty, um, pretty inert and is stable for quite a while. The, the major agents of deterioration that you want to worry about with that, though, is still light um, and high temperatures because it will get pretty sticky if, you've, um, if you're in a humid environment or if it's just sitting out in the light. So, <coughs> storage, all right. So the general rule, stability is key. You want to avoid major swings in temperature and humidity and, um, and sources of light. Uh, so um, circulation is better than no airflow. Uh, I know I'm guilty of it myself. Uh, I've got photographs packed away in closets, in boxes. Um, a better way to go about it would be to have them um, not in boxes and closets. Uh, <laughs> but <clears throat> definitely no storage in attics or garages, and basements can be questionable to water sources. Christine talked about it, but the idea of keeping things four to six inches off the floor can go a very long way, because if that sump pump goes and you've got water in your basement and you've just got your um, I think happened to my mom. She had a light bright box full of all of our um, childhood photographs sitting on the basement floor and those got wet once and so that was the end of those. So also important to think about avoiding outside walls of a building um, and storing photographs and photographic albums on outside walls. There's really big swings in temperature and humidity depending on the season. We're pretty lucky where we are, obviously. Um, you can do your hair and it stays put. The humidity isn't too bad. Um, but in other places, like where I grew up in Wisconsin, um, humidity generally during the summer is ranging between like 80 and 95 percent. And so um, that's, a, that's a big consideration thinking about those, those fluctuations in humidity and temperature and then where you've got your stuff stored. All right, so let's see. Something else to think about. Um, Christine addressed it very well, but I will hit it again. Mold, pests and insects, disasters, fires and floods. Um, if, if, 
any of these should plague you, it's not the end of the world. There's a lot of uh, really great simple things that you can do to take care of uh, take care of stuff in an instance of fire or flood. Um, there's conservators, there's many conservators. Uh, one source that I really like is the Northeast Document Conservation Center, and there's some information from them in your packets there, and they've got a lot of great online tutorials. Like, uh, there, I just had a house fire. Um, where there's a lot of water damage, what can I do for my photographs? What are some simple things that I can do? Um, so things to think about there. All right. Um, some th also um, some do's and don'ts. This is a photograph album from when I was a foreign exchange student in Germany in 1997. Um, don't use albums like this. <laughs> the, uh, the glues and the materials that the plastics are made out of are generally some pretty sketchy stuff. They're all petroleum based, uh, agents of deterioration. You can see the difference from this page to this page. I'm pretty sure that this page looks a lot different than this one because I peeled this open about four or five times. I used to have this picture of my host sister and I in a frame and then I stuck it back in there. And so, um, so that's what kind of did the number there. In the case of photo albums, older is better. So this is a photograph album from my grandparents' honeymoon trip to Yellowstone in 1950, the first and only time they ever took a vacation off the farm. Here's them feeding the bears. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you can see they've got the, um, my grandma used the classic photo corners for these. That's really the best practice if you want to go the album route is to use the photo corners. Yep. Um, the paper on this album too is also pretty high quality paper. Um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna make the assertion that it's acid free or lignin free or archival quality, but those older papers were just better quality, period, and so there really hasn't been much deterioration of what the, the photos are mounted on. Yeah, at Yellowstone. Yeah, well, yeah, they went to Yellowstone, Yosemite. There's pictures of them driving through the tree at the Redwoods. And it's, like a, it's almost like a, a thing you would buy. Right? Right? It's such, oh, it's such a good timepiece. I love it. Um, so, yeah, the this style of album, though, if you can, if you can get a hold of album paper that is uh, acid-free and lignin-free and unbuffered paper, um, there's, there's different types of storage papers out there, buffered versus unbuffered. Um, and the, the Gaylord book that you guys got tonight gives you a really nice rundown of buffered versus unbuffered. I'm not gonna get into that right now. But when you're buying, um, when you're buying papers for storage of photographs, make sure that you get something that doesn't just say acid-free. It needs to say acid-free, lignin-free, unbuffered. Because if it's just acid-free, I'm guessing that that's probably some shoddy quality paper and that it is going to become acidic over time and potentially do damage to your photographs. So something to think about there. Um, another thing that I think is really great for storing photographs is something called a four-flap enclosure. Um, exactly what it sounds like. There's four flaps there. Um, this is my dad's family in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 1956, getting ready to accept refugees from Hungary. Um, so yeah, just go in your four flap enclosure, close it up. You're pretty much good to go there. Where do you buy those uh, Those are available through a number of vendors. Um, you're not gonna find them at Michael's or, or, <laughs> or Joanne or anything like that. Um, my preferred sources are Gaylord Products, University Products, um, and the, the URLs for those various vendors are on the, um, on the key takeaways sheet. So they're pretty helpful websites, and uh, both of those companies, and a lot of archival storage companies will do custom stuff for you too. So like if you've got, um, you've got funky size folders or funky size items, they'll do custom boxes, and they're not outrageously priced or expensive, and their turnaround is pretty quick. I think the last custom order of boxes that I did for the park took like maybe a week and a half turnaround. So they're pretty quick on that. Um, in terms of <coughs> storing um, negatives and slides, um, Mylar or Melanex pages of this sort of bent are, are pretty good for that. Um, 
they'll they'll keep everything accessible um, and the the mylar and melanex plastic just it doesn't really deteriorate all that badly so so far as we can tell like this stuff has really only been around for what like 40 years so <laughs> we don't know ultimately what it's going to do but um, that's a, a good way to go about it. Um, and again, if you're, if you're storing um, individual prints, the best practice really is to go with your, your Mylar, Melanex, polyester sleeve, and then double sleeve it inside another pocket just like this guy. So these are a little bit more readily available, but I don't think I've seen them at Michael's in a while, so. What about those photo boxes that they sell? Mm -hmm. So those photo boxes, while like a lot of times they have really pretty designs on them, um, who knows what chemicals went into the printing on the designs on the outside of those boxes or what sort of quality paper that they've used on the inside of the box. Like if the box or if the product, you know, when you get it and it's wrapped up in plastic and it says acid free, lignin free, unbuffered, you're probably okay. But kind of the like the the cheap $5 photo boxes with pretty designs on the outside, I would kind of stay away from those and go more for something like this. Um, the, these are the, the trifecta, um, acid-free, lignin-free, unbuffered. And they're another really great thing about this style of box, like A, they come in really in a wide variety of sizes, but they also, um, they're a really great barrier. If you were to have a flood in your house, um, or if, I've seen it when archives have ex experienced floods too, the outside of the box may be saturated and may warp a little bit, but the stuff inside is generally okay. So um, it's, it's worth it to go for these. Um, uh, sort of like a, a second best though um, practice, um, the, the plastic shoe boxes, they'll, they'll be okay. Um, let them off gas for a while before you actually stick anything in them when you bring them home from the store and then, um, then put your stuff in them. But um, I've, I've got closets full of this style of box at home, um, so. Yep, and they, they come in various sizes, uh, five by seven, four by five, three by five, eight by 10. I mean, you can get every feasible size out there. Um, in terms of some books that I like to use um, in taking care of things, this is the Archivist Photograph Bible um, by the Society of American Archivists, Photographs, Archival Care and Management. This will tell you everything about photographic processes. Um, best ways for storage, um, scanning specifications too. If you're looking to, like say you've got a whole collection of slides that you want scanned, yeah, you can take it to Costco or Archer or um, uh, Wassums. Um, but if you want to do it yourself, it's got all the specs for doing that in here and for how to, um, how to maintain digital files long term. I didn't want to get into digital files tonight because that's a whole nother animal. Um, Earl Bennett of um, Leetal County Historical Society, he lives out in Genesee. He's kind of a digital guru. Um, so if you run into Earl, Earl can hook you up. Um, another good quick reference book um, is this guy, Preserving Your Family Photographs. Um, this is a little, a little less in the weeds than the Society of American Archivists book. And then for just stuff in general, this book that, by the Smithsonian, Saving Stuff. This is another good Bible to refer to in terms of taking care of things. So, all right, that's all I've got tonight. So we've got time for Q and A, I guess. Yeah. This is sort of an odd question, yeah. but I'm single. I have no children. Mm -hmm. I have some fairly old family photographs, some of whom I don't even know who the people are. Yeah. Is there any place that's interested in having some of those that might have been done with some of those previous types of processing? Does that make any sense? It does, yeah, like if, um, if you're thinking that and it's- I, I mean, someday somebody's just gonna throw them away. Right. And if they can go someplace where somebody would have mm -hmm. want them for some reason. Yep, like if they're, if they're place specific or if a lot of them are, um, if a lot of them are from a particular photographer, like on a carte de visite or a cabinet card, oftentimes the photographer is indicated. We have a lot of photographs at the park that come from um, the Bowman Studio in Pendleton, um, or there's the Strauss Studio in Grangeville. Um, if you can kind of identify where those images came from, historical societies, 
in that particular place will generally be interested okay. in them. Um, and I'm not sure, um, I know that for a while the Getty was pretty interested in just kind of amassing all kinds of images, demonstrating mm -hmm. all kinds of photographic processes, but I don't know if they kind of like got their fill yeah. of everything that they yeah. want. So maybe they're not they're not taking stuff so much anymore. But yeah, if you can if you can isolate where stuff came from, um, that's yeah, because they're all still in their original like cardboard whatever it was yeah. frame. Mm -hmm. So yeah, speaking so it should of be on there. Speaking of cardboard frames. Um, <clears throat> Here's an example of a cardboard frame that I, before I knew what I was doing, I dissected it. Uh, luckily, I didn't do any damage to the photograph. But if you've got images that are in a cardboard frame that like seem like they're not going to come out of there, just leave them in there. Don't take yeah. them out. Yeah. Um, like with the daguerreotypes and the ambrotypes, you just want to leave them in the case. You don't want to take them out and risk damaging the, the photograph. So, yep. So it used to be people used to put uh, textiles and things in like um, cedar hope chests mm -hmm. and cedar chests. Do they still think that it's a good idea for textiles to be in cedar? Um, not that I've heard of. Uh, that's, I mean, not preferable, I would imagine. Um, I just can't think that, or I would imagine having a textile in an enclosed space, you might get like musty odors or like agents of deterioration. And I think the big thing with textiles is they're so susceptible to um, those agents. So to have some type of protective covering, and I know like cedar is uh, probably would be good enough, but that's the other thing I forgot to mention is sometimes, especially with objects that you have in your home, kind of work with what you've got. So if you can't make those techniques that I talked about happen, if you do have objects in cedar stores, it's probably good enough and that's fine. But um, I, we don't do that in our museum and I haven't heard of that specifically. I would take cedar over mothballs any day. Right, mm -hmm. that, yep. was a, that was my next question. Okay. Is, does anybody use mothballs anymore? People do, but in museum standards, I would I would avoid them. I would it, rather than mothballs. I would re, uh, I would regularly monitor your items and keep those little cedar blocks in there as opposed to mothballs, because um, okay. that'll generally do the trick. So. so one other thing, if your textiles are supposed to be laid flat, mm -hmm. say you have a collection of quilts or coverlets, mm -hmm. can you take a um, like a double bed and lay a quilt on it and then another quilt on it and another quilt on it and lay them flat over a bed and then cover them say with a cotton sheet. Yeah. Does yeah. that protect them better than folding them and putting them in a cedar box? With the folds you're looking at the stress on the fibers right. whereas on the bed you're and it's whereas on the bed if it's not exposed to light. Um, yeah. True. And also, you want to tend to avoid those creases that could become permanent if you keep them folded. So that's right. I know something that we're trying to mitigate at our museum, just because they've been folded for so long. You really want to try to avoid those um, that stress on those fibers, like Beth mentioned. So. Um, yeah. I have a question. Um, Native Louisiana. And yeah. I'm thinking about all the storms that we've had, and people literally have to flee and just take a mm -hmm. hurricane route and mm -hmm. go. Mm -hmm. And I heard somewhere in the last year or so, if you can't do anything and you're in an emergency situation, take your family pictures and put them in the refrigerator mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then go. Yep. So when the house floods, you have a seal yep. in the fridge that would protect them from the water, anything that comes with it. Yep, I've heard fridge or dishwasher too. Dishwasher. That was the other one. Dishwasher. Yes. Dishwasher yeah. or a deep freeze if you've got that. Um, yeah. Preferably not in a basement. Yeah. So um, I would say take the other things out that's going to swirl and then put your other things in there. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, luckily we don't deal with that around here. Wildfire though. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's ironic you asked. I'm actually going to southern <laughs> Louisiana to remove my father's um, medals and photos. Probably next month. Not yet. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yep. Um, there's uh, 
the, the community of conservators in the United States and internationally, they're all wonderful people. I don't know that I've ever met a conservator that I don't like. Um, and there's a lot of really great conservation websites out there too to give you sort of tutorials on those best practices of um, what you can do with what you've got at home. The, the first rule of conservation, um, don't do anything that you can't reverse. Um, so chemical processes, adhesives, um, you just want to be really careful with those things and particularly if you're dealing with paper too. Um, WSU has a conservator in its, um, in its archives and special collections, Linnea Rash, and she's always been a really great resource for us at the park um, in terms of just consulting with us on needs of, of paper and books in general. So, yep, so she's a great local resource. So Beth, one other question. So if you have family pictures that you, that you greatly esteem, is it best to save the originals and make copies for display? Exactly. The originals? Yep, thank you for addressing that. That totally slipped my mind. But yeah, if you, if you want to keep a, a picture on the wall in your living room, make a scan copy and then um, stow away the original. Especially with, <laughs> I've got a great photograph of my dad and I when I was a toddler and it's, um, it's a Polaroid and like during high school and college I had it sitting out in the sun and the, the damage is apparent. So, yep. Again, um, if you have any questions that uh, may pop into your mind later, please do contact us. Um, both Christine and my email address are on the info packet sheet that we gave out tonight. Um, we love helping people, so let us know um, if there's anything that, that you need to know. This was very, very good. excellent. Oh, thank you. Glad to do it. So much.